Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and tonight I am delighted to be joined by Laura Bradburn and also Sean Connolly who is dialing in all the way from Australia. It's 1am, he's wearing the grey and pink Celtic away strip, am I right? Yes he is. Silver and pink, yes. Silver and pink, nice one. And um, it's a Saturday night where we are, Sean, and uh, Laura and I are obviously looking forward to this. Your dedication is even more so because it is 1am. The teams have been released. I'm going to come to you for your reactions. First of all, Sean, what do you make of the lineup? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's no change from last week's game, or is there anyone? It's, it, Juranovic, it's good. I think. Yeah. Oh, Juranovic, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, the right back. Uh, yeah, I was, I'm was. i happy. Uh, I'm hoping to see Maeda get a few extra yards on that hand and pitch, stretching things. Kyogo as well. I always used to think, I'm looking forward to this in a way that we've looked forward to games at Handen for the last seven or eight years that we really didn't the seven or eight years before uh and you know having an Ange team playing out there is, is something as well and, and you know obviously our last visit to Hamden wasn't so great so hopefully we'll be able to bury some ghosts there yeah remedy that just in case anybody who is tuning in hasn't seen the team we are lining up as follows Hart, Juranovic, Carter Vickers, Starfelt, Bernabe, McGregor, Hatati, Moy, Jota, Maeda and Kyogo and the bench is made up of Bain, Johnston, Yentz, Yakamakis, Abada, Turnbull, Kobayashi, O'Reilly, and Forrest as well. Laura, what was your reaction when you seen the line not being released? Um, to be honest, I was I was very surprised to see um to see Juranovic in there. We we were talking a little bit about it before we came on air, and I was sort of, you know, we were sort of saying about. There are certain players in that lineup, Juranovic being the most obvious one, who, if you believe everything you read, uh, is literally on his way out the door, and yet we're still appearing to rely on him. Which you can look at that one of two ways. Um, until he's officially not a Celtic player anymore, then he, he needs to do a job for us. Or the other way you look at it is, we should have enough in reserve for the post Juranovic. Uh, period that is coming up um, so I was surprised to see his name on the team sheet um, and I'll be looking for him specifically to um, to put in the kind of performances that we know he's capable of because I think uh, as I said uh, in the last match coverage that I was on he's not really done that since he came back from the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Well let's run through the team but before we do that um, Sean mentioned Hamden. Laura what's your relationship with Hamden like? Uh, I mean well the the best the best memory I have of it was um I was at the Scottish Cup final, which I think was Larson's last game, the one he scored against in Fermlin. Mm -hmm. Um so that was one of my highlight memories. And another one was um I got a, a ticket to um I think it was a semi final, Scottish Cup semi final, and I was going on my Todd because that's the way things work sometimes, and uh, ended up standing behind three guys that I went to school with, so we had a rare old time. Um, and uh, I mean, it's a it's a love or hate place for a lot of people. The atmosphere, I concede, isn't great, but um, but you know, it, it is what you make it. And I think hopefully, um, it's been a it's been a good place for us to go the last few years, and hopefully, it remains the same tonight. I'm not a massive fan. I've got to say, uh, Sean, and I think it goes back. Someone actually brought this up on. Twitter earlier today, I think it goes back to that Hamden season, which was the first season that I had a season ticket um, and it was pretty poor <laughs> all round, I know that we did eventually win the cup by beating Airdrie 1-0 Van Hoydonk, but um, I'm not a big fan of the stadiums but particularly behind the goals you're so far away from the pitch mm -hmm. um, what about yourself, I mean I know Anne just spoken about all the different elements that means this game is completely different from last week's game uh, the stadium being one of them, the competition being another. Uh, what's your take on Hamden Park? Oh, the stadium, uh, the stands are shocking. The, the distance you are from the pitch is just appalling. If you're the back row behind one of the goals, like you may as well get a telescope to try and see the opposite end. Uh, and it's it's not like there's any big screens showing you the action either. It's just like the old pixel scores up on the board, nothing else, you know. Um, it's, it's more when I'm reflecting fondly as a fan it's more reflecting on the actual pitch and how it suits us as, as a football team and it mm -hmm. makes it harder for teams like Comarnt to just uh, close those gaps uh, it is, is more what I was th thinking other than actual Hamden itself being any fair shake it always baffles me that that's like uh, 
one of your A grade FIFA stadiums in, in Celtic Park isn't, you know. And uh, I think that, it all, all comes into the bus stop is the sort of difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's bizarre, it really is. And um, I've had some good and bad experiences at Hamden Park. One of the worst, actually, was against tonight's opposition in the League Cup final when they beat us 1 0. Uh, let's not go there, though. However, there's quite a few comments coming in in relation to Juranovic. And just as Laura was saying that, um, she was quite surprised that he was in. Stuart Taylor comes in to say, patch him if he wants to leave. And uh, Mark E thought Juranovic might start. He's our player and our best right back. So we start with Joe Hart and goals. This is obviously going to be his first start in the League Cup this season. Segrist is injured, Baines on the bench. And at right back, we've got Juranovic. So there's been all this talk. In fact, the talk has been ongoing throughout the season. Uh, from the very beginning of the season, in the pre-season, when uh, Romano said, I think at that time, that Chelsea were interested in him. Um, he went and had a, a very, very good World Cup, got a bronze medal at the World Cup. He's come back. His club form's not been that impressive. But there are other teams apparently interested in him, Laura. However, what does this say about Ange? If you're at my club, I'll play you, if you're the best option. Because he even, he even played ball in goalie a couple of times last season, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was like a hint to that with the last thing that I said. I mean, that that's an attitude that you could you could have um, is that uh, he's a Celtic player at the moment, and so he should be able to do a job for Celtic. And certainly, uh, that appears to be the way Ange's is, is dealing with things. He's going to try and put the best eleven out that he thinks will do the job tonight. And if he thinks Juranovic features in that, then then so be it. Um, my only concern with that is regardless of what Ange thinks is best and what, regardless of what he thinks should be the case as far as a Celtic player is concerned, I'm not sure Juranovic shares that attitude. Um, uh, I might be being a bit harsh on him, but I, I think he's got a bit to prove in terms of attitude and application um, over what he's performed like over the last couple of months. Even before he went to the World Cup, he was kind of... Mm-hmm. Uh, dipping in form, so um, yeah, I would like to see more from him. Get get him bombing up and down that right hand side, and getting people in his pocket like he did against against Brazil at the World Cup. You know, I think it was uh, leading up to the World Cup. Uh, the World Cup. Someone on Axon, I'm not, I can't remember who it was that said it. Reckoned that uh, Ralston had been our best right back up to that point. Might even have been yourself, Laura. Um, up to that, that stage. Like, that sounds like something I would say. Eh? Yeah, I'm going to get you credit for it. You're getting the credit for it, right? Um, yeah, forever and ever Celtic. We're going to talk about some of the comments that Ange made in his presser because, of course, Yakimakis is in Japan. He's about to sign for someday. Um, how he's managed to get back and be on the bench at Hamden tonight is anyone's guess. And uh, Paul Diet comes in, even in Axom. Ange throws another curveball, picking Juranovic. I have a feeling he'll have a very good game. Um, Johnson came in uh, under difficult circumstances I thought he played a blinder at Ibrox, Sean, and I think he played very well against Kilmarnock. Um, he'll mm-hmm. be pretty disappointed uh, to be missing out tonight, I would suggest. Uh, one thing that I'd noted uh, from the Kilmarnock game at the weekend is was he was popping up on the, the left wing position at times. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'd, I'd mentioned it on our podcast that um, that is not something that our fullbacks normally do uh, because they're basically abandoning uh, their their. They're two friends on the other side who need them for triangles. So I, I thought he might be getting a bit of a tactical speaking to after that game. Uh, as much as we love the enthusiasm and effort, uh, I don't think it works. Uh, suits the tactical system that we play. So I, I, I agree that he's been great and I'm surprised to see him dropped. But uh, I, yeah, I think it might be something to do with that and to do with Juranovic kind of knowing the system better. And he must have showed up in training this week as well. And, and I would also hope that he's embarrassed about his performance at Ibrooks and, and has feels like he has some making up to do. No, I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, it puts me in mind of I read Teddy Sheringham's book, Laura. I read a lot of football autobiographies, many of which are formulaic, um, and Teddy's was, but there were some good tales about Brian Clough in there, and Mm -hmm. he spoke about uh, basically just getting sharing him to sit on the bench one week, and Clough kind of spoke him through what he wanted by using somebody as an example in the park. Now, Mm -hmm. I know Ange is not going to sit next to uh, Johnson, but, you know, what Sean said there, look at the system, understand the system, don't find yourself at left wing if you can help it. Um, And also, you're right, Sean. Um, Juranovic does have something uh, something to prove, right? He's come back, Laura, 
yes, he's he's a third uh, World Cup winner, uh, get, gets a bronze. He comes back and has an absolute stinker at Ibrox. And it would be nice to see him performing a wee bit better tonight. Yeah, just um, if anybody's looking for a tip, um, another good football book is Provided You Don't Kiss Me that chronicles Brian Clough and Peter Taylor's career uh, over a 40-year period with a writer called Duncan Hamilton. I was about to say the best football book I've ever read, but of course that excludes the uh, present company, obviously. Um, but... I <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but listen, I, I, think, I think as far as uh, Johnston's concerned, I would rather... We had an enthusiastic, naive player who needed to be reined in rather than one who had to be forced to do more work. Um, and I think that's the better way to be. Um, and I think Ange will do that. Ange will make him more tactically disciplined and more aware of what exactly it is that he's got to do in the role. Because let's let's not forget, we've all talked about the fullback roles and then Ange team being some of the most complex tactically to understand. So it's understandable if he's not got that right off the bat, um, but I think he will come good. As far as Juranovic is concerned, he knows what's expected of him. He's been working with Ange for, for so long now. Um, you would expect him to give give his best until such time as he goes to play for the 15th place team in Serie A or whatever he happens to do. Exactly. <laughs> Talking of jerseys, that one that Sean's wearing is in the book and it's the only one that was never worn by the first team. Never ever wore that, that jersey. Um, some might say that's a good thing. I'm not quite sure. I, I think it's <laughs> going to turn into a cult classic, you know, like some of the old 90s jerseys. Um, Ian Matheson, this weather's a level. The weather is absolutely atrocious out there. Um, and Urban Culture comes in to ask the same. What do you think, Sean? I mean, obviously, we're a ball playing side. It certainly does kind of level it out a wee bit when you go out and the conditions are horrendous like they are tonight. Well, uh, sorry, I'm in Western Australia. It's balls hot here you're gonna to have to tell me what the conditions are like <laughs> well we're just a bit jealous put it this way right um the rain is rattling off the roof we're in a kind of industrial unit here and the rain is mm. absolutely pelting off the roof at the moment and i think it's the same in glasgow i, I don't think the the wetness is going to make uh, have any significant negative effect i think that sometimes it can help us make things a bit slicker uh wind on the other hand might be more of a problem uh is it is it blown heavy over there blown a gale apparently to is use it? a wee scottish term yes um horrible night of football says chill pill but when angie's involved i'm pretty sure that we can remedy that at the center half um stage there at the center half positions laura Carter vicar starfield I think most of us agree it's the best centre-half partnership that we have. Um, but what I'm getting during the week there is almost like this is the, the two ends of the scale. I'm getting people talking about Carter Vickers edging himself into their greatest Celtic 11 of all time. And I've still got people saying to me, Starfelt, I'm not convinced. So I'm going to ask the question, right? Um, I was asked the other night what my greatest Celtic eleven was. My two centre-halves were Van Dyke and Paul Elliott, um, Laura. But if Carter Vickers puts in another couple of seasons of these performances in the hoops, he could be knocking on the door. Um, and I still think Starfield's getting a bit of a hard rap. I, I mean, what's there not to like there, Laura? What's your thoughts? I think, I mean, I've been a vocal critic of Starfelt for, for a long time, but I think his game has improved massively and I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. I think where people are still uh, a little bit concerned and where it takes a long time to earn people's trust back is if you've made the type of mistakes that, that Starfelt has made uh, and they've, they've seemingly come out of nowhere in some situations or he's he's made a hash up of a pretty simple pass or he's he's been caught under the ball as many times as he has no matter how well you're playing and for how long there's always that thing in the back of people's minds that it this could be the ball coming over the top that he's going to mess up and I think that takes a long long time to get out your system we're talking about a guy who has um only just been with the club um probably about 18 months now and for the majority of that 18 months, I would say up until the last six months, maybe that those um, problematic features were a major part of his game. So if he's been sort of, to use to use a phrase, a bit of a, a bomb scare at the back for more time than he hasn't been, then um, then it takes at least that amount of time again, I think, to, to, earn, to earn the trust of the support back. But I think he's going the right way about doing that. Um, 
I'm still pretty convinced that Ange wants Kobayashi to come in in the long term as a as a left footed um centre mm. back to to allow the distribution of the ball to be more evenly spread, and I still think actually Starfield himself probably would would benefit from being the right sided centre back sometimes in place of Carter Vickers. I think a lot of where Starfield's problems come from is he's not very comfortable on his left foot, and that can force him into awkward positions playing as the left centre back. So there's 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 problems with him as a player, but there's also problems with the position he's being asked to play as well. And so um uh, you know, if I can find it in my heart to praise him, then I'm sure anybody can because I was one of his biggest critics, uh, especially in the early days. And how close is Carter Vickers to getting into your greatest Celtic eleven of all time? Well, at my obviously my Celtic eleven greatest Celtic eleven of all time is heavily weighted by players I've actually seen. And it's very, very hard to oust any of those centre backs, Valhar and Mialbe or Baldi, that were in that O'Neill team. Um, Carter Vickers has probably come about as close as Van Dyke to doing that. But I've still got a soft spot in my heart for Mialbe. By the way, he's looking even more shredded nowadays than he did when he was a Celtic player. Have you seen him recently? He's my goodness. just too good looking, isn't he? Sean. What a machine. <laughs> what a machine indeed. <laughs> uh, Sean, we're talking about players you've seen, of course. Um, uh, are we getting a wee bit too uh, carried away with Carter Vickers? I mean, he, he has been absolutely astonishingly good since he came in, hasn't he? Uh, he's he's brilliant. He's I, I think he's outstanding. Uh, I, and I've said recently that if we could have a left-footed Carter Vickers uh, playing beside himself, then that'd be amazing. We could just have Carter on one side and Vickers on the other. <laughs> um, and I don't know how we can find something like that and, and that might even be part of the problem with this this kind of star, anti-Starfelt thing and I, I'm famously anti-Starfelt and I've decided to rebrand myself as uh, pro Kobayashi instead uh, So <laughs> and I, I've been working my way through this and trying to figure because I absolutely everything that Laura said is rhymes true with me and I've tried to figure out kind of why do I not like Starfelt who is probably the second best centre back in Scotland why, why do I not like him uh, and Big part of the reason I think is that he reminds me so much of Joseph Simeonovic. And when we moved on from Joseph Simeonovic, I was kind of relieved and hoping we could get somebody, you know, more that they, they wouldn't give you that kind of fear. Uh, and, and and it feels like we're just kind of rehashing that a little bit, uh, even though he is good. Uh, just I'd, I would like to have better somehow. I don't know how, but I would like to. It's interesting. We've got Jens and Kobayashi sitting on the bench. It's um, one of these things, I think, until such times as Starfield goes through a rough patch of form, uh, Kobayashi and, and Jens aren't going to get into that side, I, I don't think. Now, Damien Moore comes in to say that he would take six million quid for y- Juranovic. I wouldn't. I'd keep him. If that's if that's the biggest bid you get, I'm, I'm keeping the player, Laura. I wouldn't be taking six million quid for him. I think you're better off with him. Um, than taking that that kind of money. Um, and again, we asked the question, how much is he worth? Kevin Graham spoke about it on Wednesday. It's very difficult to say. What do you base it on? What, what do you base that on? And sometimes it's not even the player. It's on how much the club needs a right back. And if you get two clubs that are in that position and it's coming to the end of January, that's where obviously the inflation occurs. At the left back position, uh, sorry, Kiara Rogan, before I move on. Good morning from Vancouver Celtic Supporters Club. Hail, hail. Yes, we do. We have noticed, Kiara, a, a huge um, upsurge in our Canadian fan base ever since Johnson signed. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, left back, Laura Burnaby. Time to shine because, I mean, he wasn't going to displace Greg Taylor anytime soon, was he, for any lengthy period of time? Yeah, no, I think I've, I've made my, my feelings pretty clear on, on Burnaby the last time I was uh, on the show. Um, and he didn't uh, he didn't pull up any trees in the subsequent performance that he made. Um, a good a good player with good basic um talent and skill. Um, but I think actually mentally is where his game needs to improve massively, and he needs a bit more maturity, a bit more discipline, both in terms of his emotions and in terms of his positional play. Um, but he's also got that ability to provide that little bit of magic, like he did for that goal. Um, that that right. Jota scored. Um, so. There's there's conflicting feelings there as far as a player's like that concern is concerned because I like to have a player who can do the unexpected 
Um, even if for 85 of the 90 minutes they, they, they don't look like um, anything to write home about. So um, I'll be interested to see. Uh, it looks like he might get a little bit of a run in the team in this second half of the season, perhaps, um, especially since the timeline for Greg Taylor's injury isn't uh, entirely clear. So um, this is his opportunity, really, I think, to, to really stamp his stamp his name on that shirt and hopefully um, f- hopefully for him anyway um, really kickstart his career at Celtic Yeah, it, it's been a bit stop-start, a big part of that Sean I think has been the, the form of Greg Taylor but he's getting a chance now uh, due to the injury um, and it was a brilliant pass it was fantastic uh, the way he cut open the defence at the weekend there um, however there are some concerns about his defensive qualities, where do you stand on that one Sean? Well we're going to find out early tonight, uh, the Star jumping bigot will be placed on top of him, I reckon, and they'll attack him in the first <laughs> five minutes of the game. Uh, that's what he does. That's going to stick. That is going to stick. Yeah, that's, really a cra- that's a cracking wrestler name, by the way. The star jumping bigot. <laughs> so yeah, he'll be he'll be on top of Burnaby. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen because uh, they they did that at the weekend. They targeted Burnaby early on. That it didn't really play out for them. Carter Vickers covered well. Uh, but I'd say it'll be a different uh, thing with uh, Kelly Lafferty uh, going up against them. Uh, so that's got to be their tactic, right? Um, yeah, you're right. Yes, he like he's getting better every game that he plays. Uh, what's not getting particularly better is his, his distribution. He's still quite wasteful with, with possession, but he seems to be really leaning into his strengths, which are you know his his movement, his run, his touch, uh, his mm-hmm. dribbling. He's very very good at those things, and to the point where when you look at him, you just see basically see a converted winger. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I've, he's definitely improved a lot. But he, he, that's you're right to say the areas he does need to improve in are his defense and his, and I think Alan, Alan Morrison mentioned it with you yesterday is. Uh, what's the word clinical passing I guess would be, might mm-hmm. be the term mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's good that Maeda's in, in front of him because he does give you that kind of coverage defensively and he's he's a workhorse um, as well what's happened to Segrist asks Pedra uh, Mark it was confirmed by Ange that Segrist is nursing a wee injury at the moment Otherwise, he probably would have started tonight because he has started the League Cup games. I'm going to break away from the team for a second to ask you guys. We've already been asking about your best centre-halves in your lifetime. Um, Derek McInnes reckons this is the best Celtic side that he's faced. And I'm guessing that is as a manager, Laura. What did you make of that? And how do you compare Ange to the Invincibles? I mean, my memory might not be serving me well here, but I think perhaps to to try and understand what Derek McInnes is talking about, and Lord knows that's a task in and of itself. Um, he's maybe talking about, I I think this particular team, I think Angie's team on their day can absolutely rip a team to bits, can get an 8, 9, 10 goal uh, drubbing of a team. And while maybe Brendan's team were more consistently dominant and slipped up less, obviously, in terms of dropping points here and there, I don't think they had the ability to absolutely blow a team away quite as well as as Angie's team do. I think mm-hmm. they had the ability to do it. Don't get me wrong. I, we're t- we're really um, um, splitting hairs here between the two teams, but I think that's maybe what he's talking about. I think if you're an opposition manager going up against this team, um, it's more in your head that you could really be on the wrong end of a um, an absolute hiding compared to the to the Brendan Rodgers team. Brendan Rodgers team. The Invincible season, as much as there were those dominant wins, it was often about grinding out results, especially towards the end of the season, to keep that Invincible run going. Whereas Angie's team um, don't really tend to grind out results. They, they more tend to blow teams away um, or, or maybe being on the losing end occasionally. So that's maybe where he's coming from. But um, to be honest, if you were asking me to pick between the two, I couldn't exactly do it right now. I think this is a more enjoyable team to watch for me, um, whether it's a better team uh, remains to be seen. Yeah, it's interesting because when I brought it up yesterday, someone in the comments, and I didn't get a chance to bring them up, uh, thought that um, the quality of other sides in the league now is better than they were back then, uh, which is an interesting one. I also felt, Sean, that Carter Vickers versus Dembele would have been some head-to-head if uh, we really were to pitch the Invincibles against Angie's team. What's your take on it? What do you, what do you make of McInnes's comments there. I mean, obviously, 
he's I don't think it's mind games. You know, if that's the way he thinks, that's the way he thinks. It's a compliment to Ange and his team. <clears throat> yeah, I get what he's saying. Uh, and I think that the Ange system, Ange team uh, really suits us when we're playing domestic games. Like we do, as Laura says, we do absolutely just like teams just don't know what to like. They're to the point where they're intercepting passes from the ball boy. Like they, they're just like <laughs> absolutely run out of ideas of how to do anything with us. Uh, and it to be that, but the flip side of that is I would actually, if you put Ange's team up, uh, you know, 11 v 11 versus the Brendan Rodgers Invincibles, I actually would expect the Rodgers team to win. Uh, I think uh, the Ange team has struggled on against those teams with more quality. Uh, and, you know, th- that's not in Scotland. We've not had that face that quality in Scotland, but in, in Europe, we don't have such a great record. And, and I think that's something that, you know, I think a Rodgers team would win 2 1 probably at that case. Uh, and, you know, they, maybe like Scott Sinclair would probably score. He'd get in between Starfelt and, and uh, Bernabe or whoever. Uh, I think that's where it would come from. It's interesting. Yes, we are. Um, just uh, make believe. It's a wee bit of fantasy, but hey, that, mm-hmm. that's fine. Kaiser, um, Varanoia is rife. How, how come I've not heard that before? Varanoia. Good shout, Kaiser. Hopefully, we're not talking about uh, Var after his game, but I wouldn't put any kind of money on that. Paddy Lavery reminds us that it's six more sleeps until Gracie's because uh, obviously Brian McClare will be joining me on stage for a Celtic State of Mind live at Gracie's. And if you want to come along and join us uh, that particular night, it's sold out, but we will be running a couple of competitions during the week for some tickets. And you can come along and see us with Danny McGrain in March. Ticket link is underneath this video. Midfield, Laura, um, of McGregor, Hatati, and Moy. Are you surprised that Moy keeps his jersey? Um, Not particularly. I think he's... He's not my favourite style of player. If you ask me to pick between uh, between him and O'Reilly, who I'd rather have in the park, I'd rather have an inform O'Reilly. The question mark comes as to whether O'Reilly's form recently has has merited a place in the team, and and Moyes certainly has. I think. I think he had a, a maybe a slightly overpraised World Cup, but certainly one that that was worth noting. Um, and had a good a good couple of standout performances for the majority of of some of the games, especially that game against France um, springs to mind. Um, but I'd, I think if you're Aaron Moy, if you were dropped um, after your recent performances, you'd be disappointed. So um, I'm not particularly concerned to see him in there. I think Hatati and, and McGregor, you know, pick themselves. Um, but I, I think the only question I have is going forward in the next few weeks, what's going to happen to his form continuing to play and what's going to happen to, to O'Reilly's form if he doesn't get a chance in the first team again soon but that's what Ange gets paid the big bucks for is to, to manage situations like that Yeah, Laura said quite rightly Sean about his form but he was in he was in good form when he got dropped to Ibrox wasn't he and I know mm-hmm. that Ange looks at every game um, for its own individual merits but but Moyes certainly on there uh, in that side uh, due to his performances I think he's been excellent actually since he came back for the World Cup Oh, he's so technically gifted and he can just see things. Uh, his biggest downfall is that he gets caught in possession because he can be a bit pondersome at times and gets, and that was what Samirin exposed when, when they beat us. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic that uh, not, uh, you might think, oh, he doesn't move very fast. He's got more ground to cover in this big pitch, but I'm actually looking at it as he's actually going to have more space to operate and more time on the ball uh, because players will be further away from him. So I'm quite optimistic that he could have a, a big game for us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And then up top, I guess, um, it's not a big question. Kyogo's the number one striker, Laura. Um, and he starts Jota on the right. Hopefully, he's going to come back into the form that we know that he can. But um, a lot of talk this week about Yakamakis and the fact that he was meant to be in Japan, etc., etc. He's sitting on the bench. Um, how do you see that one developing? Um, I think Yakimakis won't be a Celtic player by the end of the January transfer window. I think the phrase no smoke without fire comes to mind. Whether it will be Japan or somewhere else, I don't know. Um, but I think there's enough evidence there to suspect that that you know his preference would be to move on. Um, but one piece of praise I will give him, give him is that uh, unlike uh, Juranovic, I think his attitude has remained pretty good uh, on the park, and that's all I want to see from him uh, until he leaves uh, Celtic at whatever point that that is. I just want him to provide and show the attitude that he has. Um, during his time as a Celtic player and for his, his priority to remain scoring goals, which I hope if he gets the chance he does tonight. 
Yeah. Well, what's your thoughts, Sean? Because, I mean, we're playing with one up top. Yakamakis, I think, has, when, when he's been on, even against Kilmarnock, very unlucky not to score a goal. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's always he's always there. He's not one of these surly players. I mean, I don't know what he's like at training, but he's certainly not in the park for what I've seen. Do you expect him to, to be gone? It's a tough one, isn't it? Um, it seems to be all down to, to money and contracts. I and mean, when players get to that age, they, they really want their last big contract. And look, uh, his game the weekend against Kilmarnock, was, his effort was fantastic. And he was singled out by Ange after the game uh, for praise. So... Uh, not in the media, but like on the pitch uh, in the media aftermath. So um, as long as he, if he keeps doing it for the next few weeks, great. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of 50-50 on it. Uh, and I would also, another option is that he might end up just turn around and signing a new contract if he doesn't like what's what's out there when he's had a sniff about. So uh, as long as he's still putting in the same effort as he did at the weekend, then whatever way the transfer shakes out, I'm I'm not too fussed. Absolutely. Now, Stevie Boy has uh, cottoned on to the fact that I've got a Liam Gallagher mug there. PJD is Team Liam. That's only because no doesn't sell mugs on his website, Stevie. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have one. But they're better together, aren't they? Um, that's the only thing, actually. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think that they would be better on the same stage in the same band. Quick prediction, Laura, before we go to the action. I know uh, you love them. I'm going to say... Uh... I'm going to say 4 0 Celtic. Uh, I hope we don't, in the words of their broth commentator, I hope we, they don't pump us, Nate Wadoots, or whatever it was he was saying. <laughs> Nate Wadoots. Uh, Sean, what about yourself? Cheesy oh, peeps. Um, <laughs> I, I think 3 0. 3 0 Celtic. Well, let's go for it then. We'll see you at half time. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Like the video, and, uh, we'll, and we'll see you in about 45 minutes. All that's left for me to say is thank you to Laura Bradburn and Sean Connolly for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. More hoops. <laughs>